Well, folks, the state of the race is moving away from Kamala Harris. We'll bring you all the updates momentarily. First, your reminder, Daily Wire Plus and Jordan B. Peterson bring you the Mastering Life Collection, essential guides on everything from marriage to mental health, including his newest series on depression and anxiety. Get unlimited access to Jordan's wisdom, plus upcoming series on negotiation and success. Join Daily Wire Plus at dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code Jordan for 35% off your annual membership. So, Panic is beginning to set in over at Kamala headquarters, and there is a reason for that. There is some brand new polling from Quinnipiac yesterday, and it shows that Kamala Harris is dropping like a stone in some of the swing states. In Michigan, the last poll they had, September 16th, had her up five. Today, Donald Trump in that same poll is up three points. That is an eight-point swing in favor of Donald Trump. Wisconsin, the last poll, had Harris plus one. Today, Trump plus two, 48-46. Pennsylvania, Last poll, Harris was plus six. Today, she is up only three. So even Pennsylvania, where she's spending tons of money, according to Quinnipiac, she's dropping like a stone. And this is predictable because the reality is that Kamala Harris was always a balloon. And once you poked the balloon, the air was going to start coming out. The air has been coming out of that balloon really quickly at this point. Mark Halperin, who's an excellent reporter and pollster, he points out she could lose all seven swing states pretty easily. Here's how I framed it this morning in my newsletter. The conversation I'm having with, with, with Trump people and Democrats with data are are extremely bullish on Trump's chances in the last 48 hours, extremely bullish. You think of the seven battleground states, which ones is Harris in danger of losing? I would say Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, North Carolina, and Georgia. I'm not saying she'll lose all six, but she's in danger. The only one that the Democrats say she's not in danger of losing is the one I never say the name of because I can't pronounce it, but it's where Las Vegas is, right? You guys agree with me? She could lose any of those six, right? I mean, she could lose all seven, but Democrats will tell you they're worried about this, those six. They're less worried about the seven. Okay, well, that is bad news for her, quite obviously. One of the things that's happening here is that it is quite possible that actually Trump's vote is being underpolled. The reason for that is because it is extremely difficult to get low and mid propensity voters to answer poll questions. So when a pollster calls somebody up, if you're a person who's like definitely going to vote, you want to talk to the pollster, you want to show your support for the candidate. But let's say that you're somebody who sometimes votes, sometimes doesn't. Maybe you voted in 2016, but you didn't in 2020 or you voted in 2020, but not in 2012. You're a low or mid propensity voter. And those voters don't like to answer poll questions. If you get one of those people on the phone, you're a pollster, that person's gonna be like, dude, I'm busy. I don't even care that much. Here's the thing. Donald Trump is leading among low propensity voters and mid propensity voters, 52 to 45. Kamala Harris is leading among high propensity voters, 51 to 47. What does that mean? Well, normally that's a pretty good bet for Kamala Harris because obviously you'd rather have high propensity voters, people who vote all the time, rather than low propensity voters. The problem is that in the polling data, it is difficult to even tell who is voting for Trump and who is not because they're not responding to phone calls. That's an actual real problem that people have been trying to model out and they're having a real problem modeling it out. According to CNN, sources in the Kamala Harris campaign are having 2016 flashbacks. This has been a campaign that was described by multiple Democrats, allies, aides uh, to the vice president as a good vibes campaign. But what's also creeping in now is that anxiety. The reason for that is because these polls are not really moving. Despite multiple battleground blitzes, despite uh, the opportunities she has had uh, across media outlets, there is still not a lot of movement from voters who are moving more towards her versus former President Donald Trump. Uh, in fact, I had one source describe it to me this way, quote, people are nervous. They know the polls are tight. And a lot of us are having these flashbacks to 2016, too. We know when it can go the wrong way and it can still feel fresh. So 2016 is the key here. OK, and if you compare what's happening now to 2016, Donald Trump is in a better poll position than he has been at any point in any race he has ever run. And it's just the reality. I'm looking at the Michigan statistics right now. Right now, Donald Trump is up. In the Real Clear Politics polling average, about half a point. In the last three polls, he has a lead, including the Quinnipiac poll, where he has a three to four point lead. Hey, okay, now compare that to 2016. At this point in time, in 2016, Hillary Clinton had a 7.3 percentage point lead on Donald Trump in Michigan. In 2020, Joe Biden had a 6.7% lead on Donald Trump in Michigan. Donald Trump only ended up losing the state in 2020 by about 2.7%. 
in 2016, of course, he won the state. And the same thing is happening in the rest of the swing states as well. Take a look, for example, at Wisconsin. Right now, Harris is leading, according to the Real Clear Politics polling average, by about half a point. Okay, but in October of 2020, Joe Biden was leading by five and a half points. Okay, and if you look at what she was doing, Hillary Clinton in 2016, Hillary Clinton in 2016 was leading by 6.3 points. In 2016, Trump won the state. In 2020, Biden won the state by 0.63 percentage points. So that is a gap of like 5% from what people thought was going to happen by polling data this date in 2020 and what actually ended up happening in 2020. Well, Kamala Harris's campaign is at huge risk. You know, it's another amazing risk, one that you don't actually have to take. That would be going online without ExpressVPN. Dumb idea. It's like putting all your passwords and credit card numbers on a huge billboard for the whole world to see. In today's digital age, your personal information is constantly at risk. Every time you connect to public Wi-Fi, you might as well be handing out your passwords and credit card details to strangers. You think I'm exaggerating? Well, here is a fact. It doesn't take a tech genius to hack somebody these days. Any kid with a bit of knowledge could be stealing your data. And trust me, you really don't want your private information out there. This is why I don't go online without ExpressVPN. Whether I'm traveling for work or prepping for my next podcast between coffee runs, ExpressVPN creates an encrypted tunnel so secure, it would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to crack it. It's incredibly simple to use. You just open that app, you click one button, you're done. Here's the thing. Your data is incredibly valuable. Hackers can make thousands of bucks selling your information on the dark web. But ExpressVPN actually protects your privacy. It works on all your devices, so you're covered no matter what you're doing online. I can't recommend ExpressVPN enough. I've been using it for years. Whether I'm researching for my books or gearing up for debate, ExpressVPN is my go-to. When it comes to online security, no room for compromise. Secure your online data today. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S vpn.com slash Ben. Get three extra months for free with my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Ben. The same thing is happening in Pennsylvania. According to the latest Pennsylvania polling for Real Clear Politics, Trump is up by 0.2 percentage points. In 2016, Hillary Clinton was leading by nine at this point. In October of 2020, Joe Biden was, leaving, was leading by seven at this point. The final results in Pennsylvania, by the way, is that Joe Biden won by 1.1 points. So if, if you're looking at these polling stats, what you are figuring right now is that Donald Trump is in a pretty solid position if he is getting underpolled at all. And again, virtually every poll ever taken about Trump underpolls his supporters. Now, people say that 2022 is an exception to the rule. In 2022, it appeared that Republicans were going to do better and then they did worse. Was Trump on the ballot in 2022? He was not. When Trump is on the ballot, a bunch of people who don't normally vote or respond to pollsters show up. Now, are pollsters trying to gauge for that? Maybe, but we really have no idea at this point. What we can tell is that we just have a lot of blinking warning signs, a lot of lights going off for Kamala Harris. According to the Washington Post, the steep decline in voting in Wisconsin by one of the most loyal Democratic constituencies in recent elections, black voters, presents a challenge to Vice President Kamala Harris, who needs to maximize turnout among black voters to win this essential swing state. Joe Biden carried the state in 2020 by about 20,000 votes, less than one percentage point. In 2012, with Barack Obama on the ballot, 78.5% of the state's black voting age population went to the polls. That rate plummeted in 2016 when 46.8% of the state's black voting age residents cast a ballot, and that then fell again to 43.5% in 2020. Meanwhile, between 2012 and 2020, white Wisconsin voter turnout slightly increased from 75% to 77%, and Hispanic turnout leaped from 44% to nearly 60%. Now, do you think that Kamala Harris is going to get 79% black turnout in, in 2024, like Barack Obama did in 2012? Do you get any sense that the Black community is as excited about Kamala Harris as they were about Barack Obama in 2012? No way. No way. So she, here's where she's lagging. She's lagging among minority voters. Everyone can see this from every poll. She's lagging among black voters. She's lagging among Hispanic voters. She's overperforming with single white women. She's overperforming just a little bit with seniors. With white men, blue collar, non-college educated white men, she's really underperforming. And she's going to underperform with men generally. So she's got a huge problem on her hands. Now, the biggest problem, of course, is that the Democrats were hoping that by swapping out Joe Biden, a terrible candidate who's going to lose, for Kamala Harris, another terrible candidate. And remember, it, it's so funny to watch everybody try to pretend away what we all knew before she was swapped in. Before she was swapped in, Joe Biden and everyone else in the Democratic Party knew she was a bad candidate. They knew it. They were open about this. This was not a secret. 
everyone knew she was a crap, a terrible candidate. She ran in 2019 and 2020, and she dropped out before getting to her home primary of California. She ran one of the worst presidential campaigns in modern memory. And then she was picked up off the scrap heap by Joe Biden to be his vice president. That's her political career. That's her story. She then proceeded to become the least popular vice president in modern American history. And when they swapped her in, suddenly we were supposed to believe that she was fetch and she was brat. Well, turn and they were hoping that that would last the, the short campaign, that if they could somehow get from mid-July to November, if they could do it over the course of four months or so, then they could make her president without anyone asking a second question. The problem is the attention span in American politics is no longer one month. It is no longer one week. It is now about five minutes. And that means that people demand more from the candidate. People have already made up their mind about Donald Trump. I've said a thousand times at this point that whoever the election is a referendum on loses. If this election was a referendum on Joe Biden, he was going to lose. And that's what it was. Then when they swapped in Kamala, it suddenly became a referendum on Donald Trump because Kamala was kind of a nothing burger. And because she was a nothing burger, it turned back into a referendum on Donald Trump. But now, as Kamala Harris overstays her welcome, and again, she has a very short shelf life. That lady politically is like a bottle of milk on expiration date. You got like five minutes before that stuff starts to smell sour. And right now you're watching her go sour with the American people. The American people are sick of the brat. They're sick of the vibes. They don't believe in the joy. They don't believe in any of this stuff. Even that sugar high that Democrats were experiencing is starting to dissipate. And you can feel it when you talk to Democrats. If I talked to a Democratic friend a month ago, like, yeah, man, she is great. We feel the energy. We feel the joy. We're so, and what that was, that was a sugar high from having put old Joe out of his misery out back and not having to run him anymore. But now the sugar high is wearing off because every time she opens her mouth, she's Julia Louis-Dreyfus from Veep. That, that, that's who she is. And there's no way around it. So, for example, she is trying to edge her way into the hurricane coverage that's happening over Hurricane Milton in Florida, which is pummeling the state. She's tried this a few ways. So first, she actually actively called into CNN. Now, I wasn't aware that she was leading hurricane efforts. In fact, she has nothing to do with hurricane efforts. In fact, she has no authority over hurricane efforts. She wants it both ways, of course. She's had authority over everything and nothing at the same time. But she decided she needed to call into CNN in order to do a little electioneering to demonstrate just how much she cares about the hurricane. You know, when she's not sipping beer with Stephen Colbert. Vice President Harris, uh, I believe that you are now on the telephone fresh off of that briefing that we all saw here on CNN. Thank you so much for, for being here. What is the most important thing that you learned that you want to amplify for Americans who are in the path of this dangerous storm right now? The briefing was very helpful on a number of fronts, but most importantly in getting the word out to folks in Florida in particular to please heed the advice and direction of your local officials because this storm is unlike anything we have seen before and that's the point of emphasis well that's you know with that kind of brilliant insight i think that it's there's a reason she probably called in i mean people are taking kamala harris very seriously not the governor of the state of, of florida who's actually handled multiple hurricanes over his tenure kamala harris who admitted just the other day that she started calling governors about hurricanes five minutes ago when she became a presidential candidate. Well, Kamala Harris, you know, she's a fake. She's a phony. She's kind of a blind. Speaking of blinds, remember the old way of shopping for custom window treatments? Waiting around all day just to get an overpriced quote from a pushy salesperson? It's like dealing with big government bureaucracy, but, you know, in your living room. Well, those days are over because blinds.com has invented a better way. With completely virtual consultations and free samples sent directly to your door, you never have to deal with a salesperson in your home ever again. Whether you're a DIY warrior defending your home from the sun's tyranny, or you just prefer to use their professional install services, you can count on blinds.com to deliver top quality window treatments. From premium woven woods, motorized shades, you can get unlimited custom window treatments installed for just one low cost. At blinds.com, there are never any hidden fees or showroom markups. The price you see on the website, that's the price you pay. Imagine that, honest pricing. Now, I've used blinds.com myself. Let me tell you, it is really, really easier, like easier than shopping in person. I love blinds.com. They're trustworthy across the board. They've got great selection, accessible experts you can talk to live, installers who actually know what they're doing. When I use their service, they help me with everything. The measurements, the installation, the whole thing. It was seamless. They have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you're not happy with the style, color, or fit, 
They'll always work to make it right. So here's what you need to do right now. Go to blinds.com right now. Get up to 40% on select styles. That's right. Save up to 40% at blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. How's she handling things? It's going well. She did a conference call, actually, with people ranging from Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas of the Department of Homeland Security to Administrator Deanne Criswell, who's the head of FEMA, to Admiral Linda Fagan, who's a commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, as well as the director of the National Weather Service, Ken Graham. And Kamala Harris was leading this thing. She has no idea what she's talking about. So during this live telecast conference call, she's getting fed questions by her people. They're in the room with her and they're feeding her questions in real time. And she gets annoyed because she is having a voice in her ear. And so she puts her hands over her mouth and says, I'm trying to handle a live call right now. I'm on a live call right now. I'm sorry, this is just lowbrow comedy at this point. We really got to watch those those areas and those communities. So it takes quite a while for that water to drain. Thank you very Uh, much. Oh, well, she's really in charge right now. It's a live broadcast, she says, before immediately asking a question that was fed to her. (laughs) I also love that she covers her mouth while she's on a live mic. That's not how microphones work, lady. I'm on a mic all the time. Not how they work. But then again, she doesn't know how earphones work either. She takes pictures above hurricanes and hurricane damage with her earphones not connected to her phone. In other areas of expertise, she's trying to try it out. She's such an empty suit. My goodness, she's an empty suit. That, that lady is an entire men's warehouse of empty suits, truly. She's out there warning of price gouging and fraud. And th- this is such tiresome tripe. It truly is. Every time there's a hurricane or a natural disaster, there is a shortage of supply when it comes to gas. And so in order to effectively ration gas, the price mechanism jumps the prices. Because otherwise, you run out of gas. If you have 10 gallons of gas and you keep them at the normal price, it turns out that the gas runs out real quick because I'm just going to buy up all the gas I can at that price before it jumps. But she's warning about price gas. That's that's what everybody in in Sarasota is worried about today. They're they're deeply worried about price gouging, that she's she's going to be the person in control of the price gouging because she's done such an amazing job after initiating a 40-year inflationary spiral. Finally, as the president mentioned, to any company that or individual that might use this crisis to exploit people who are desperate for help through illegal fraud or price gouging, whether it be at the gas pump, the airport, or the hotel counter, know that we are monitoring these behaviors and the situation on the ground very closely, and anyone taking advantage of consumers will be held accountable. Okay, well, as long as she's reading directly from a statement about stopping price gouging, that, that's the kind of leadership America needs. Now, here's the thing. She is currently at war with Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. Governor DeSantis has been excellent at this. This is one of the untold stories about Governor DeSantis when he was running for president. It's not just that he passed a bunch of policies that are very conservative. In terms of the nuts and bolts of actually administering the state, he's excellent at this, truly excellent. And by the way, there is a Florida disaster fund. The state of Florida has an official private fund that supports response and recovery. If you want to help out, you should text disaster to 2222 or visit floridadisasterfund.org. There will be a lot of people in need. Or you can also go over to our friend Tim Kennedy's Save Our Allies Originally established to respond to humanitarian crises left when we have been in Afghanistan. They're currently on the ground in North Carolina. They're on the ground in Florida as well. Visit SaveOurAllies.org to learn more and donate. Again, we're going to drop all the links in the description below so you can make sure to do that as well. But Ron DeSantis has been busy, you know, actually trying to help people in the state. So here yesterday was Ron DeSantis suggesting, listen, the responsibilities with us, and ain't with FEMA, right? It's, it's our job to do what we need to do. Most people are, are, are wise to this. You know, we live in an era where if you put out crap online, you can get a lot of people to share it and you can monetize that. That's just the way it is. But if you're hearing things, something that's just outrageous, just know in the state of Florida, none of that stuff would, would ever fly. So you don't have to worry about that. FEMA is not leading this, this show. We are leading this show here in the state of Florida. OK, again, this is what leadership looks like. Right, it's taking responsibility. It's taking accountability. It's not blaming other people. It's not blaming price gouging. It's not blaming the governor of Florida for not calling you back and giving you the sads because you're the center of the universe, as you have been your entire political career, coddled and and 
preened by everyone around you? It's actual leadership. Here's Governor DeSantis yesterday saying they have 50,000 linemen ready. We have also worked with the utilities uh, to have the largest staging of utility workers and linemen in advance of the storm uh, any time in American history. We will have in Florida, by the time the storm arises, over 50,000 linemen, and those linemen are being brought in from places as far away as California. Again, that's what leadership actually looks like. That's what leadership actually looks like. And meanwhile, Kamala Harris is ripping that guy. She's busy ripping that guy. It's political malpractice. So what is Kamala Harris left with? The desperation campaign is setting in. They're getting desperate now. They've tossed hundreds of millions of dollars into advertising at this point. They have a billion dollars that they've raised. And it's not going to matter. Because if you keep tossing money down the toilet that is the Harris candidacy, I'm not sure it's going to reap magical benefits here. So Kamala Harris has been forced to now make the argument that Trump is just, he's going to lose because he's so divisive. Man, how many times are you going to go back to this well? That well has been dry for a long time. Here she is on Stephen Colbert, you know, where she cares about the people by drinking Miller High Life in the middle of a hurricane. I'm traveling around the country. I'm spending a lot of time talking with folks, listening to folks. And the one thing I can report back from the field, if you will, is that people are exhausted by that old, tired playbook of Donald Trump's. They really are. And... Um, and even if they voted for him, even if they voted for him in the past, there are a lot of folks who are just saying, you know, enough of the rhetoric that's about trying to divide the country and have Americans point their fingers at each other. You know, folks are ready to turn the page. It's like, let's chart a new way forward. And, and what I'm seeing is that a lot of Americans, regardless of their party, Republicans, Democrats, independents, they're ready for a new generation of leadership that is about solutions and common sense and finding common ground. And, and that is what I, I am offering. No, you're not offering anything like that. You're just a liar. Kamala is a fibber. She's pretending she's moderate. She's actually quite radical. And let me just tell you, the IRS under Kamala Harris will be a disaster area. Speaking of which, if you're still struggling with back taxes or unfiled returns, handling that alone would be a huge mistake. It can cost you thousands of dollars. In these challenging times, your best offense is Tax Network USA. With over 14 years of experience, the experts at Tax Network USA have saved their clients millions in back taxes. Regardless of the size of your tax issue, their expertise will work to your advantage. Tax Network USA offers three key services, protection, compliance, and settlement. Upon signing up, Tax Network USA will immediately contact the IRS to secure a protection order, ensuring that aggressive collection activities like garnishments, levies, or property seizures are halted. If you haven't filed in a while, if you need amended returns, or if you're missing records, Tax Network USA's expert tax preparers will update all your filings to eliminate the risk of IRS enforcement. Then, they create a settlement strategy to reduce or eliminate your tax debt. The IRS is the largest collection agency in the world. Now that tax season is over, collection season has started. Tax Network USA can even help with state tax issues. For a complimentary consultation, call today 1-800-958-1000 or visit their website at tnusa.com slash Shapiro. That's 1-800-958-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash Shapiro today. Do not let the IRS take advantage of you. Get the help you need with Tax Network USA. Tim Walls has been out there lying on her behalf as well. He was asked about her position. He was on Fox News Sunday. He was asked about her position on illegal immigration and undocumented immigrants, illegal immigrants receiving government benefits. Now, throughout her career, she's been very much in favor of illegal immigrants receiving massive government benefits. Here's Tim Walls walking it back. She, of course, has never answered a question about it. Look, the vice president has made it clear that she has policies that make a difference. Her border policies are the most strongest, the fairest we've seen. It's but the now, bill Governor, that was, you know uh, a lot of people, including your own party, would not join that statement. Mm -hmm. There are millions of people who have come here over the last few years that, um, you know, they, they see this as an the open policies, border. Well, simply we have a policy. Donald Trump sees it as a political. Ridiculous. Ridiculous people. So they're shifting their positions all over the place. She's banking on people just not liking Trump. Good luck with that. And then there's the actual desperation by the surrogates. So the surrogates are really losing it. So, for example, here is Pod Save America host Dan Pfeiffer on MSNBC, who says our big problem is that we just don't have, we don't have any real, we don't have any, you know, real media infrastructure. That's their problem. They're already making the excuses. Here come the excuses. Trump isn't doing it all. There was some reporting, again, about the Manovers, but in terms of that, you know, blanket the airwave strategy that you just outlined, that's not what Trump is pursuing. And I wonder if you have a thought about what might be behind that. Well, there are two reasons behind it. He's old, 
mentally declining and lazy. So that, that that's that's the first reason. The second reason is he, Republicans have something Democrats don't, which they have a massive uh, media operation between Fox News, Daily Wire, all these people. We don't have that yet, so we have to work harder to do it. So first of all, we appreciate the shout out. We appreciate the shout out from our friends over at, uh, at Podsafe. I got to say, Dan Pfeiffer, I don't know what it, maybe he's a subscriber or something. This is like the second time he's gone on MSNBC and name checked us. The first time he was calling for us to be censored, of course. But you're on MSNBC, my dude. I, I thought Positive America was a fairly large podcast. I'm, I'm also aware that there's this network called CNN. There's also one called CBS News. There's one called ABC News and NBC News. It's crazy. It's like you have the New York Times and the Washington Post and the non-editorial pages at the Wall Street Journal. Why, it's it's pretty insane. Wet, like NPR. I mean, I, I can't, but we, we are, did you know that how dominant we are? I mean, first, again, thank you for the compliment, Dan. Really appreciate it. But the excuse making, the excuse making, she's going to lose because you guys don't have a media infrastructure. My goodness. Whew. The levels of delusion. Or how about Donnie Deutsch on the same network? And he's already coping. He's drinking straight from the copium dispensary. He says that the, the, the problem is that the souls of Donald Trump voters are corrupt. Corrupted souls. That's that's the issue. I'm, I'm going to listen to Donnie Deutsch about corruption of the soul. What uh, happened right. to us? What is wrong with yes. us? I, I feel like I'm living in another country. So like, I, I'm going to really feel that way come if the election goes in the Trump direction. It's like, how bankrupt yeah. have so many souls become? Oh, the desperation. Oh, the desperation. And meanwhile... Donald Trump is getting big crowds. Donald Trump is campaigning. He is leading in a lot of the polls right now. And the reason for that is because the issues that America really cares about, they're on Trump's side. When it comes to immigration, it is clear from how Kamala Harris and Tim Walls are running away from their original immigration position, both of them, because Walls is also super soft on border issues. They're running away from it because it turns out Americans are border hawks. On China, it's Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. Tim Walls used to spend every other day in China. He's been... He's been in China 30 times. That's crazy. I ain't been to no other country 30 times. 30 times? That's crazy. Okay, but now he and Kamala Harris are trying to pretend that they're going to be harsh on China. Why? Because Donald Trump is the one who really opened that up. How about increasing domestic energy production, including fracking? Now you got Kamala and Tim Walls trying to pretend they're pro-fracking based on their long record of hating fracking. Yeah, all these issues are, are issues on which Trump wins. How about Israel? Notice that Kamala Harris and Tim Walls have been trying to have the baby there because it turns out that actually most Americans are very much in favor of Israel kicking the living hell out of Hamas and Hezbollah. How about, for example, economic growth? It turns out that people don't like overregulation. People don't like higher taxes. So Kamala Harris is having to campaign as a middle-class tax cutter. The bottom line here is that Americans don't like her policies and they don't like her very much. She's not particularly likable. She's not particularly wondrous. She's radically inauthentic and everyone knows it. We'll get to more on this in a second. First, with Robinhood Gold, you don't need a silver spoon to eat up the financial favors of the 1%. Robinhood Gold allows others to get the rates and perks usually reserved for the high society. Now the resourceful individual with Robinhood Gold can earn the very liberal rate of 4.5% APY on uninvested cash, receive unlimited 1% deposit bonuses, and be rewarded with a handsome 3% retirement boost on an IRA account. Robinhood Gold provides the privileges of a high net worth for any net worth. These generous benefits are now available for only 5 bucks a month. The new gold standard is here with Robinhood Gold. Sign up at Robinhood.com slash gold. Terms apply. For product-specific disclosures, visit Robinhood.com slash gold. Investing involves risk. Rates may change. Gold membership is offered by Robinhood Gold, LLC. Meanwhile, that's the last thing you can say about Trump. Yep, obviously I know President Trump. The thing you cannot say about Donald Trump is that he is always himself. That even his opponents will concede to him. He's on Andrew Schultz's podcast yesterday. And... um. I will say, Donald Trump is a very funny human. Here was President Trump slamming Joe Biden for sleeping on the beach. He has one ability I don't have. Yeah. He sleeps. He can sleep. This guy goes on a beach <laughs> and he lays down on one of those, you know, six ounce. They, they weigh six ounces and he can't lift it. Yeah. They're, meant, <laughs> no, they're, meant, they're meant for okay. they're meant for children. Yeah. Young people yeah. and old people to lift. Yeah. They aluminum, you know, hollow aluminum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They weigh very little. And he can't lift. 
And somebody convinced him he looks good in a bathing suit. And when you're 82, typically bathing suits aren't going to make you look great. Right, you're right. not going to be enhanced. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Is that that's, I mean, that's just better content than anything that Kamala Harris is doing. It just is. She goes on, call her daddy, a, a soft show, and she's talking about abortion laws. And Donald Trump has gone on Andrew Schultz and telling jokes about Joe Biden in a bathing suit. I'm sorry. He's just way more interesting and entertaining than she is. He's way more authentic than she is. I don't know that authenticity has to be the core component of a successful politics. I do know that inauthenticity ain't going to win you any prizes. And Kamala Harris is so radically inauthentic, she cannot be off teleprompter. She cannot. It is a disaster for her. So she can't campaign on her character. She can't campaign on her likability. She certainly can't campaign on her policies. Donald Trump skunks her on policy, particularly on foreign policy. We have two major ongoing wars in the world. She's been terrible on both of them. Meanwhile, here is Donald Trump explaining his foreign policy to Andrew Schultz yesterday. Iran has an open threat out for me. Right. And that's bad. And Biden, if he were a real president, if he were uh, uh, the kind of guy he should be, yeah. mm -hmm. should say, if anybody shoots a former president who's now the leading candidate, Valley. even though he's le leading against Democrats, uh, we will... Bomb that country into oblivion. Mm. And it would stop. He's right. He's right. But that's something that Kamala Harris will never say. Ever. And Americans actually like being able to deter our enemies, as it turns out. That is a thing that we typically like. And the, the likability factor here is, is, is a thing I think that has gone by the wayside in a lot of the analysis of this race. Because there's so many people who just hate Donald Trump, who really hate him. I think that they, they spun themselves into a lather thinking that Kamala Harris was actually somewhat of a, of a wonderful, joyous person you'd want to have, a, a, if not a beer, then a wine with. The reality is that she is not. She is not. And the more you get to know her and the people around her, the less you like them, which presumably is why I'm never going to stop talking about this. Why is it that the entire legacy media are ignoring allegations that her husband beat up a woman in 2012? Why? Why are they ignoring allegations that he knocked up the nanny why are they ignoring allegations that when he was at his old law firm, he was hitting on the help? Why? They don't have the excuse of pretending that it's irrelevant because he's a spouse. The New York Times literally put out a piece yesterday about Mark Robinson's wife. I'm not even kidding. Quote, Yolanda Robinson, wife of Mark Robinson, has had scandals of her own. North Carolina's second lady helped make her husband's political foray possible, but her ventures, a daycare and a nonprofit, also caused problems. So I have a question. When is the last time that the New York Times reported about Doug Emhoff and assault? The answer, never. Literally never. They have never reported on it. They reported one time about him stooping the nanny, one time back in August. And that's it. That's the only time they ever reported on it. The active cover-up of everything about Kamala, everything. I mean, we're talking about her history. You're not allowed to talk about her early beginnings with Lily Brown. Don't talk about that. That's rude. Don't talk about it. You're not allowed to talk about Doug Emhoff and her husband and their wonderful, lovely marriage. You're not allowed to talk about who he is at all. You shouldn't talk about that. You should not talk about her policies because after all, you don't know what her policies will be. Was she the president? You're not allowed to talk about the fact that she's a complete failure at everything she has ever touched. Well, it turns out the American public are tired of this. They're tired of this and they have trust issues. And the media's trust me routine with Kamala Harris, it ain't going nowhere. And one of the reasons it's not going anywhere is because she's already the vice president of the United States and she's doing a terrible job. And one of the biggest issues that undergirds this entire election is, of course, economics. And we've talked a lot about immigration. We've talked a lot about foreign policy. The economy has sort of flown under the radar as an issue because as inflation has started to wane in terms of year on year growth in, in inflation, because of that, the media have stopped covering it so much. But the reality is the American public look at Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and what they see is inflation and stagnation. That is what they see. And that's more of what she promises. Now, this week, the federal deficit hit one point eight trillion dollars trillion. That's the deficit, not the debt, the debt. The national debt right now is approaching thirty six trillion dollars, which is almost one hundred and forty thousand dollars for every single person in the United States. And that is not counting the unfunded liabilities. That's just what's on the books right now. And what's Kamala Harris's plan? To spend more money, which means future economic stagnation. If you keep spending without actually growing the economy through deregulation and innovation, 
what you end up with is economic stagnation, austerity programs, tax increases, regulatory confiscation. Everyone knows that's where this is going. Underneath all of the happy-dappy do-nonsense that she is touting is a really hideous economic policy. And I think most Americans in the back of their mind, they know that she has been the vice president of a terrible economic administration. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, over the past two years, DW Plus has collaborated with Dr. Jordan Peterson on a collection of shows to help you win at life. The Mastering Life Collection with Jordan B. Peterson is now available. The Mastering Life topics range from marriage to masculinity and managing mental health with Jordan B. Peterson's newest series, Depression and Anxiety. Plus, coming this fall, Jordan Peterson's two new Mastering Life series, one on negotiation, another on success. Become a DW Plus member for unlimited access to Jordan B. Peterson's incredible Mastering Life collection today at dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code Jordan at checkout for 35% off your new annual membership. That's dailywire.com slash subscribe. Go check it out right now. When it comes to Kamala Harris's economic plans, all she is pledging is more spending without end and without a way to pay for any of it. So her big proposal this week, for example, again, in the face of news that we have a $1.8 trillion deficit this year alone, her big proposal is that Medicare ought to cover long-term care at home. Now, how exactly do you pay for that? Seriously, how do you pay for that? Because basically what you're just saying now is that the taxpayers ought to pay for a nurse to go to elderly people's homes and take care of them. That ought to be on the government, meaning the taxpayer, meaning you. Okay, what, is, what does that have to do with Medicare, per se, as opposed to paying for it through a private insurance program or paying for it yourself? Well, the answer is that she's just going to stack whatever she can on the public dime. You know, the Wall Street Journal points out that the Veep used a friendly interview on The View to lay out her plan to require Medicare to cover long-term home care for all seniors who can't live independently. She said the new benefit would help the sandwich generation of Americans who take care of children and aging parents. She put no cost estimate on this new taxpayer obligation, but home care on average costs $288,000 a year. And she's saying Medicare should cover an expense of $288,000 a year. And that's the new entitlement program that she's proposing. She says that this is going to be funded with government drug price controls. So basically, she is going to get rid of all R&D fundings. That's what that does. She's going to get rid of all R&D funding for new drugs. And then somehow we're going to fund $300,000 a year for the elderly to pay for this out, out of the public coffers. Just to do a little bit of quick back of the envelope math. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 million Americans need some form of home health care, including long-term health care, home health care. Like a nurse who comes over and helps. You're 85, you live by yourself. If the cost of that is like 288 grand per year, and you're talking about 12 million people in the United States, we'll give an upper end estimate. That's only, let's see, $3.3 trillion a year. Every year. That is her new entitlement program. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, Kamala. That, that probably won't be a burden on business at all. And especially it won't be a burden when you combine that with her insane pro-union stance. So unions are artificially driving up the price of goods and services in the United States, particularly dock workers unions. So the White House recently just handed over basically all negotiations to the dock workers union. And the dock workers unions, which already have made our ports some of the least efficient in the developed world, they are now trying to fight back against automation. So that way the, the docs can't work 24 hours a day. They don't work nearly as efficiently, which means you get to pay more because somebody has to pay for that. And that person is you. Congratulations. Also that Kamala can pay off her union buddies. According to the Wall Street Journal, at the annual convention of the International Longshoremen's Association last year, two large screens played a TikTok video from a crane operator over the docks of Los Angeles. All of this man is all automated, he said, pointing toward acres of stacked containers stretching to the Pacific. He marveled at the automated vehicles at driving amid the containers. No drivers in any of those machines. They're no joke, man. From the podium, Harold Daggett, the union's pugnacious leader, was having none of it. They say that's the future, he, he bellowed to the thousands of gathered workers. Over my dead body. Well, I mean, so we're now pushing against, you know, exactly the factors that would make life more affordable for Americans. That's what Kamala Harris has pledged to do. And we know precisely what this governance looks like. It don't look particularly good. And here's the beautiful thing about left-wing governance in America. It gets tried and tried and tried again. And it fails and it fails and it fails again. And they try it again, then it fails again. Basically, it's Portland. The, the most hilarious story of the day comes courtesy of Politico. It's titled, This Proud Liberal City is Throwing Out Its Entire Government. Why, what happened? I thought they were doing great. 
the Portland was a wonderful, joyous place. It was weird city and everything. Well, it turns out everyone hates living there and they're all leaving because bad governance means a bad place to live. Quote, few American cities faced as much chaos as Portland over the last four years. This proudly liberal city has endured more than 100 days of often violent protests, a fentanyl and homelessness crisis, a pandemic, and decriminalization of all drugs. This November, Portland is undertaking one more chaotic act. In a sign of either hope or desperation, Rose City voters decided to throw out their entire government structure and replace it with a weaker mayor, expanding city council, and ranked choice voting. A major driving factor was the passage of Measure 110 decriminalizing all drugs in 2020. That was backed by two th- by, by three quarters of Multnomah County's residents. Voters couldn't, or at least didn't, anticipate how this policy change would reshape a city already strapped for money, dealing with a public health crisis, and confronting rising rates of homelessness and fentanyl abuse. Drug use shot up, homelessness worsened, and taxpayers fled. Well, probably, you know, perfect left-wing governance has never been tried. Probably just need, we just need to try more of it. That's, that's the issue. There are now 19 people running for mayor and 98 people seeking seats on the city council. They are all campaigning on left-of-center platforms, but progressives often put blame for the policy failures on unexpected circumstances like the fentanyl crisis and on problems with implementation. Moderate candidates are bemoaning the city's far-left shift and pushing for bigger policy corrections. Like, well done, everyone. Well done. But this is what left-wing governance looks like, and you get precisely what you deserve. I don't think the American people are up for this. I think they know that Kamala Harris sympathizes more with the governance of Portland and San Francisco than she does with the governance of, say, states like Florida. That is pretty obvious. But I don't think the American people agree with her agenda. And they don't like her very much personally either. Kamala Harris's latest favorability ratings, she's three points underwater with The Economist YouGov. She's four points underwater with Yahoo News. Now, these are not amazing numbers. They just aren't. She doesn't have high... People don't love her in any real sense. Meanwhile, Donald Trump running kind of similar numbers. He's in the same ballpark. It's like minus six, minus eight. Both of them are riding at 47, 48% in the favorability ratings. In other words, she ain't nothing to write home about. And the American people are showing it in the polling data. She's got a real problem on her hands. Meanwhile, they got another problem because the their strategy to tamp down conflict in the Middle East is very unlikely to be successful here. The United States seems to have a strategy of leaking all of Israel's wartime strategies in an attempt to get Israel to stop fighting its war. It's not going to happen. Instead of just saying to Israel's enemies, hey guys, you better come to the table or Israel's going to wreck you and we're going to help them wreck you by just giving them what they need. Instead of doing that, which is the actual Trump Vance position, J.D. Vance expressed it at the VP debate, Trump agrees with it. They are both on the same page. Instead of that, you have Kamala Harris and Joe Biden whinging about exactly what Israel is doing. Oh no, it's just so sad. Why won't Israel listen to us? Maybe they won't listen to you because you keep trying to yank their chain. Maybe it's that. The Wall Street Journal has a front page piece today titled, U.S. Frustrated by Israel's Reluctance to Share Iran Retaliation Plans. I wonder why. Could it be that every time Israel shares its plans militarily, you yell about it publicly, you run over to Barack Ravid, your stenographer over at Axios, and then promptly leak it to the public? It's like every four days, the Biden administration runs to Barack Ravid to explain what the Israelis are going to do thereby attempting to thwart Israel's actual military operations. So you wonder why Israel kept it a secret? The only time Israel has had true success in the field is when they are not warning the Americans what they're going to do. The beeper operation, they didn't warn the Americans. Killing Hassan Nasrallah didn't warn the Americans. Killing Mohammed Daif didn't warn the Americans. Killing Ismail Haniyeh did not warn the Americans. Why? Why? Well, because Joe Biden and team have decided that it is their job to play honest interlocutor between American allies and America's enemies. It's incredible. According to the Wall Street Journal, Israel has so far refused to divulge to the Biden administration details of its plans to retaliate against Tehran, even as the White House is urging its closest Middle East ally not to hit Iran's oil facilities or nuclear sites amid fears of a widening regional war. I mean, what are they afraid of? That Iran's going to start firing on Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or something? If that happens, then the Sunni-Israeli alliance will ride again, and that will be the end of the current Iranian regime. President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke by phone for the first time Wednesday since August 21st. And of course, they brought in Kamala Harris. They can pretend she has an actual job. Secretary of State Antony Blinken took some time off from playing saxophone in Kiev to join the call as well. It lasted about 30 minutes. According to the Wall Street Journal, U.S. officials are frustrated. They have been repeatedly caught off guard by Israel's military actions in Gaza and Lebanon and are seeking to head off further escalation. Or, you know, they could just get out of the way and let Israel win. 
I know it's, it's so rough. It's, a, it's such a rough, terrible idea just to let your allies do what they need to do to achieve victory. But that is precisely the view of the Biden administration. Meanwhile, how successful has the Biden administration been? Well, remember that time when they let Afghanistan completely collapse and then unvetted, they let Afghan refugees come into the country? One of those Afghan refugees was an Afghan national who apparently was plotting an ISIS-inspired terror attack on Election Day to target large crowds. According to the FBI, he entered the United States September 9th, 2021 on a special immigrant visa. Days after the disastrous U.S.-Afghan withdrawal, he currently has parole status. The FBI has a photo allegedly from his iPhone, according to Bill Malugan. They say it depicts him describing to his daughter and another child the, quote, rewards a martyr receives in the afterlife. Amazing immigration policy. Amazing foreign policy. Why isn't Kamala winning? They're doing such an amazing job. I cannot even imagine. Again, the only times that America's allies right now are experiencing success is when they ignore everybody that the Biden administration sends for them. The Biden administration, they are not good at anything. They are very bad at most things. They are very stupid at almost everything. You know what else is dumb? Not getting rid of that car that you have sitting on your front lawn. Like in front of your house, you have a rusting car. Why is it there? If it's just sitting in your driveway, taking up space, you should consider donating it to Cars for Kids. They make donating your car really easy. You barely need to be involved at all. You give them a call, or better yet, donate your car at carsforkids.org slash Ben. That's cars with a K. All it takes is two minutes to put in your information. They'll schedule a pickup for a time that works for you as soon as the very next day. You'll get a vacation voucher and a tax deduction. They've done this over a million times, so you can trust you are in good hands with Cars for Kids. Call right now, one eight seven seven cars for kids K-A-R-S, Cars for Kids, or donate online at carsforkids.org slash Ben. Donate your car today. Again, you got just a junk piece of car out on the curb. There, there's no reason for you to keep that thing around, get the tax right off, give it to a cause that actually matters. Head on over to Cars for Kids by calling now one eight seven seven cars for kids or donate online at carsforkids.org slash Ben. That's Cars for Kids, K for Cars, for kids.org slash Ben. Donate your car today. Joining us online is Tim Kennedy. Tim, of course, is the leader of a charity that's on the ground in places like North Carolina and Florida, helping people out. We dropped the link below in the description of the show. So, Tim, let's start with North Carolina. What's the situation like on the ground in North Carolina? What have you guys been doing? I mean, since day one, um, I mean, as, as soon as everybody was saying you can't get in there, we were already in there. Um, Save Our Allies is definitely, you know, it's comprised of mostly special operations operatives. Uh, these commandos that are good in austere environments. So we're able, we were there as expeditionary search and rescue personnel immediately. Um, and now that we're, you know, pushing two weeks separated from the hurricane's arrival, it's, it's, it's moved from, you know, like the cities of Asheville, which are starting to do well up in the mountains. It's still very dire. You know, these people have been without water, real water, power, cell service, you know, they have to rebuild cell towers that were completely destroyed. And there was only one cell tower that would connect one valley to the next valley. So, man, it, it's it's a real mess. It's it's heartbreaking. And these are the poor. You know, the, the these the people up in the mountains, they're there by choice. Um, like they, they want that kind of reclusive lifestyle. And none of them or the vast majority of them are not like wealthy. So they their lives were already desperate before. And now it's just the next next level of desperation. Yeah, Tim, obviously you guys have people on the ground over there with Save Our Allies. Uh, there, there's been a lot of critiques of the state government, of the of the federal government. What have you seen in terms of government response? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as um, I, I have, I'm, I'm not kind. I, I, I think I can be grateful for organizations um, like FEMA that are on the ground and the men and women that are on the ground doing, doing hard work, doing the hard job of sifting through rubble to try to find bodies, but also being critical about the way that things happened. Um, the command and control that immediately should, uh, a disaster of this magnitude should have been handed over when we started bringing in the 82nd Airborne and the 101st, and you still have a governor that's like, ah, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to hand off command and control of these gigantic U.S. military, you know, very talented groups of people, it, it doesn't really make sense. Um, when I'm walking up to a hotel, and, and I was fact-checked on this, people have um, said I was a liar about this. On October 1st, I went to a Holiday Inn in Asheville after doing a health and wellness check on um, a young family at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and they haven't had power. They haven't had cell service. They hadn't had water. Um, they did just want to sleep, uh, but they hadn't showered in a few days. So I go and I check a few hotels and I go to a hotel and they have an armed federal officer at the, 
at the entrance of this hotel. And I, and they said the whole entire hotel has been booked up. And I was like, I got it. Our approach is that we have zero impact on the local economy. So that local economy is available for those that are experiencing the worst moments of their lives. Um, you know, these larger organizations, they're not as nimble. And I, but I also appreciate what they bring to bear and the amount of effect that they can have on the ground. So like, you know, I'm not, I am, it's, nobody's perfect. We're not perfect. Could they have done better? Sure. Are there elements that, you know, if we back, you know, Monday morning quarterback, we could be like, Hey, these are some things that they should change. But really when you get on the ground, these are just great Americans trying to do great work and, and help people. So Tim, obviously you are prepared. You're ready to, to go into Florida and help out well, whatever Hurricane Milton brings, you know, obviously it's it's going to wipe through the state. We, we have yet to, you know, kind of find out what the, the extent of the damage is going to be. What kind of resources are you looking to bring to bear? Yeah, we were expanding operations as North Carolina is pivoting. By no means are we leaving North Carolina and be like, hey, you know, like we're we're there for the heart. Like good luck rebuilding your homes. That's not what's happening. We are we are keeping people on the ground, ground force commanders staying there, you know, like uh, the Independence Fund and Save Our Allies is still going to be distributing goods in Florida. Um, you know, Ben, you, you said it right. We're not exactly sure the level of devastation. Florida is used to hurricanes. Um, Governor DeSantis is like he is being he is so much proactive. I already just watched a couple of National Guard um, activations going to other states all the way up into the Northeast and the Northwest. So states, you know, to the opposite ends of the country um, are receiving requests from the North. Uh, from the Florida government saying, hey, if you have you know people with these specific skill sets, can they be activated and immediately put on orders and brought down to Florida for a couple of weeks? This is happening all over the United States. And that is the preemptive, proactive approach of a governor that's used to, act, to, to working in crisis. And he's already set up a proper ICS. So the, in, the incident command system, which was the biggest failure of the North Carolina, um, specifically Western North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, um, Hurricane Helene, this has already been rehearsed. This has already been executed, you know, and, and Governor DeSantis knows how to do it. And he, he is way ahead of the game on the Save Our Ally side from aviation to maritime to boats. You know, we have two special forces um, sergeant majors. This is all they've done their whole entire lives. They are the ones that are going to be like the ground team, ground force commanders, and they're going to be using enablers to, uh, you know, force multiply and be able to get once we know where we need to be. It's kind of premature to say what we're going to be doing, but from aviation to Zodiacs to water rescues, um, we're going to have all of those capabilities. Well, that's Tim Kennedy. Go help them out right now at saveourallies.org. They're doing wonderful work on the ground in places like North Carolina and Florida. Tim, really appreciate what you're doing. Thanks so much for your work. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thanks, man. All right, coming up, we'll jump into the Vaunted Ben Shapiro Show mailbag. But remember, you have to be a subscriber to have your question answered. If you're not a member, become a member. Use Coach Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us. Folks, going online without ExpressVPN is like putting all your passwords and credit card numbers on a giant billboard for the whole world to see. In today's digital age, your personal information is constantly at risk. Every time you connect to public Wi-Fi, you might as well be handing out your passwords and credit card details to strangers. You think I'm exaggerating? Well, here is a fact. It doesn't take a tech genius to hack somebody these days. Any kid with a bit of knowledge could be stealing your data. And trust me, you really don't want your private information out there. This is why I don't go online without ExpressVPN. Whether I'm traveling for work or prepping for my next podcast between coffee runs, ExpressVPN creates an encrypted tunnel so secure it would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to crack it. It's incredibly simple to use. You just open that app, you click one button, you're done. Here's the thing. Your data is incredibly valuable. Hackers can make thousands of bucks selling your information on the dark web. But ExpressVPN actually protects your privacy. It works on all your devices, so you're covered no matter what you're doing online. I can't recommend ExpressVPN enough. I've been using it for years. Whether I'm researching for my books or gearing up for debate, ExpressVPN is my go-to. When it comes to online security, no room for compromise. Secure your online data today. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben. Get three extra months for free with my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Ben. <laughs> 